commercial photographer of mushrooms of the world. I mean, that's from a, from a hippie and a, uh, and a guitar player to a... Uh, that is fighting work. <laughs> <laughs> and he's going to tell you more about himself in a minute. So, Taylor, thank, thank you very much. Thank you all very much. Uh, first of all, of course, to the club, to Mike and Jane for putting me up. To the student audience, uh, the people that have shown up tonight, I see some faces that I'm very honored by, by seeing here to see the show. And I'm sure, I hope you won't be disappointed because uh, I had an incredible year this last year, 2013. I've had a bunch of uh, years, as I'll try and explain, a bunch of great years, but uh, this last year, I went to Madagascar, Brazil for the third time, and China for like the fourth or fifth time. But in those three plus some um, trips up the East Coast, because I'm living in Florida now, I've just got an incredible selection of photos that I want to show you. This is a brand new tour. I just did my first show, uh, gosh, was it night before last, up at the Soma Camp. So uh, you, what you're gonna be seeing has not been seen by anyone else um, before, so it's all fresh and new. And once again, they've got me so inebriated, I don't necessarily go by any script, so it's gonna be off the cuff and uh, lots of fun. And yes, if you want, turn down the lights, here we go. And if technology holds itself uh, well in my hands, that'll go like this. So first, a word from our sponsor. <laughs> you might or might not know that virtually everything that I do, my traveling cameras and so forth, are paid for by my products, especially by my calendar, books, uh, DVDs, which I have on the table. Everything's on sale tonight. Uh, calendars are three for twenty dollars. Someone said, "Well, you know, you you missed January, but I've got January 2015, so you've got over 12 months on this <laughs> calendar, and lots of countries represented there. And of course, I have a couple of uh, my treasures books and some DVDs. The DVDs are all ten dollars. You cannot get it anywhere this cheap. So if you want it, get it here, get it now, and off to the show." Okay, this is a Mendocino story. It's a California story. I moved from North, from Southern California to Mendocino late 1984. It was uh, a warm, wet back year, but it used to be wet in the wintertime. But there were all these mushrooms outside of my cabin, and I had no idea about anything about them. No one ever told me anything, but I saw them, and with an artistic background, I said, I want to take their portraits. So that week, I went to Fiddles and Cameras in Fort Bragg and bought a camera, flash, lens, film, everything, and I started taking pictures, and it has not stopped since. And one of the points I want to make tonight is that after almost 30 years of doing this, you might think, well, you might be kind of burnt out and so forth, but no. Not only am I still taking pictures of regular mushrooms, but I've got a new bug that you will see about and hear about, and that's bioluminescent mushrooms, which has really got me. So anyway, here we go. I'm gonna give you, for the people that don't know me, I'm gonna give you a little bit of background. So what happened? I bought my camera and I started taking pictures and everything, everywhere I went around Mendocino and Northern California, there was more and more new and beautiful, interesting, especially things that I had never seen before. And I always had this thing about frogs. I really, I mean, I like frogs and so forth. Put this on the back of one of my guitars. And when I started taking pictures of mushrooms, I wanted to be like a frog looking up at them. Where everybody else seemed to be looking down at them, I wanted the view as, I, as if I was a newt or an insect or a frog or something like that. So this became a signature of my style to do these gill shots. Well, <laughs> life in Mendocino was very good. I had a nice run of things there of, of uh, building. I was into construction at the time. 
But as I got this bug of, of taking pictures of mushrooms, I realized it was time to spread out. So I went to the East Coast, and guess what? More mushrooms, more and different, more beautiful mushrooms. Every place I went, it was more and more and more. In 1989, I went to the Soviet Union, uh, Finland, and Sweden. And of course, same thing, it was kind of a bad time, but nevertheless, every time I've been someplace, no matter how bad it is, there's always been something to, to uh, take pictures of and bring home. Of course, I saw these things, and as it turns out, I mentioned I was in construction, I was in the middle of building an addition on my house, and my house up in Mendocino was a geodesic dome that I uh, inherited on the property. It was just an old hippie style thing. And I was trying to think, of, you know, how do you build an addition to a ge geodesic dome? I'd gotten everything except the top of the stairwell tower, and I realized when I got home what I needed to do with that. And the reason I bring this up is because when I saw those things, I thought of puffballs and not onions. I mean, come on, how many times have you seen pyramidal warts on an onion? I'm sure they were thinking of puffballs or earth stars or something like that. Well, the last thing I did in my career of uh, construction was build a workshop. Good timing, because in 1995, I discovered the computer, and with my math and artistic background, and all these photographs of mushrooms, I started going crazy with Photoshop, having a wonderful time putting illustrations together. You might have seen this, or you could see this still on my website. It's on mushroom.pro now, and it's been on one or the other for, gosh, about 18 years. But nevertheless, so I had a great time. I've done probably 200 illustrations over the years uh, using mushrooms. And this one here is fish from the Fort Bragg fish store, a little bit of moss, and everything else is mushrooms, period. Anyway, it was 1995, and I realized everything came together. I realized this is a calling. This is something I needed to do and I needed to start doing some serious traveling. So I went to Australia, and of course Australia, Tasmania, and then Chile, and then the Amazon, and then China, and then Thailand, and Malaysia, and Africa, and on and on. Everywhere I went, more and more different beautiful mushrooms. It's just been constantly that way, and it has not stopped, period. For 30 years, it hasn't stopped. It's really amazing how this is. Anyway, and then there was that country called Florida. <laughs> so I went to, I moved to Florida about six years uh, for various personal reasons, but uh, I have some bragging rights here. This has got to be the biggest mushroom in America. <laughs> and not only that, this thing is edible. You probably would not want to feed it to your favorite guests, but if you really had to, you could probably feel, feed the whole village with this thing. Anyway, we're going to fast forward to 2013. Like I said, had an incredible year. Started off in Madagascar. Now, Madagascar is right next to Africa, but it's not really African. The people there relate to Malaysia, and I'll tell you why. About two or 3,000 years ago, the Malaysians, the Polynesians, Indonesians were the greatest seafarers on the planet. And they went all over the place. There are actually some records. People think that there were some of the early settlements in South America came from the um, Polynesians. But uh, the people in Madagascar relate very closely to uh, the Malaysians, and you can see it in the construction, the bamboo and so forth. This is a granary and, at a farm, but uh, anyway, you go into the towns, it's a little bit different because it was a French colony for 150 years, and so it looks kind of like a Mediterranean town. Very pleasant, very nice place, but what is funny, in this town, uh, on Tananarivo, the big city on the island, is that there are many different hills there, but they have these farms in the middle. 
So they have the rice fields, and there really isn't a center of town, but it's just kind of an interesting way to uh, lay out your city. Anyway, right after I got there, my host happened to be primatologist, and my main host was Dr. P Patricia Wright, who started uh, a preserve, Ronamafana, and that became a national park there. But right after I got there, woke up in the morning, they said, Taylor, get in the bus, we're going to some place. So we were heading out east here to another preserve, and uh, I was just kind of getting my wits about me with my jet lag and so forth, but they had tents and porters, they had everything lined up, and as soon as we got into camp, I was out there looking around, and sure enough, through the rainforest, uh, I started walking around, kind of get a feeling for the, for the trails. And then, as soon as the night fell, I found some bioluminescent bamboo there. And I'm thinking, well, this isn't mushrooms, but, you know, it's at, le at, le at least it glows. And so we ate dinner, and a little bit later I went out. Oops, I first have to tell you what has happened to me. This is a word I came up with. I think um, uh, you could uh, <laughs> definitely. I, I, it, it, I'll tell you what has happened. Once you once you see these things out in the forest, something goes on. It's such a special feeling to find these glowing things. This light, this coal light. It's it's um, it's a spirit of the forest. And it's almost like a religious experience, and so I have uh, kind of made up this word, lumacy, so I call myself a lumatech, but whatever. Anyway, later on, I found these little things, and in Brazil, they have a species called Mycena lucenopes, meaning glowing foot or glowing stem. And this is not like those at all, complete, completely different morphology, different shape, and so forth. But I said, wow, this is great. They're very small. And uh, hopefully, these have arrived at uh, Dr. Dennis Desjardins office by now. Maybe not. I don't know. But uh, they should be on their way so we can find out actually what this is. But um, I saw quite a few of these. And it's very exciting for me because anywhere I go and I find these, it's just a wonderful thing, especially if there's something I haven't seen before. And this shape, or this cap, like this, was uh, totally different to me. So it's left to uh, the future to find out uh, what these actually are. Anyway, there were some other mushrooms there. This is possibly a trogia. And remember when I talk about these names, I'm in uh, New Frontier. Not only am I mostly artist and photographer, but many of the things that are in these countries, like Madagascar, have not been named. Or if they have been named, they've been you know, using uh, European names or other, uh, places, from other places, and will eventually be renamed uh, more properly. So the next day after that, a uh, few days after that, we uh, took the long ride. This is the most expensive taxi I've ever taken, $300 to go to Ronomafana, but it was a very beautiful ride. Um, once you get outside the city, which isn't dirty or bad at all, it's just kind of city-like, it becomes really, really picturesque and really beautiful. So it was very enjoyable eight-hour ride until we got to Ronomafana, which is right next to the rainforest, right as, you, as you're in their facility, you're looking right across the river at the rainforest, so it's only a short walk across the bridge to get into the forest and up to many, many different trails that they have there, many different habitats. I think it's like 20,000 acres that they've managed to, and this is uh, in care of uh, Dr. P Patricia Wright, who uh, was really influential in telling them, there are lemurs here, this is really, really special, you've got to stop the loggers, and, and they did. And so they made this a national park, so it's completely closed to the commercial logging. Well, I didn't even get across that bridge when we saw this on the approaching trail, and it, if you know Marasmius, it looks like a classic Marasmius, except for this. 
And I wrote to Dennis, I, I sent him a photo, and I said, Dennis, this is like Megamerasmus striatus. You know, I just make up these names so hard. <laughs> but uh, he actually had a name for it. It's uh, Merasmus uh, Beccalacongoli. And as it turns out, I've talked to a couple people that study these in Germany, and this may be actually something different than that. I'm not sure, but nevertheless, it's a really big, beautiful Merasmus. And if you know Merasmus, they're usually really small, but this thing is really huge and really, really pretty as well. And it always has this striate fluted stipe. This is a really amazing, very new to me. Anyway, remember this because we're going to see a photo from America of this. This is Cyptochroma esprata, which is common in a lot of tropical areas. This is very small, very small little button of a thing, but uh, we'll see something like that very soon. Now, this one is a stinkhorn. I've been a fan of taking pictures of stinkhorns because, number one, I'm a visual person. I like the art of it, and this is part of who they are is they attract insects partly because of the smell of the gleba up there, but also partly because they're really brightly colored, white, red, yellow, whatever color, and they do that to attract insects, and it's an insect vector situation where the insects are actually getting on here and then carrying the spores to uh, hopefully call, start a new colony, or a new uh, mycelium in the ground. But what I noticed about these is that I hadn't seen before. In general, you would call this uh, Dictyphora enduziata, endusium being the netted uh, veil there. Uh, but this, look at these. These are very rounded. And I'm going to show you some more that uh, it's, it's quite unusual because, like you say, this is a shot from underneath. Quite unusual to see this rounded look to them. But, uh, boy, there's some spirits in the forest there handling that one as well. But, um, anyway, look at this. Here's one from Brazil, and you notice this kind of angular look to them. Uh, Hawaii, same thing. Um, and this one, oh, this is fabulous. In Brazil, about, oh, two, three years ago, I was out walking in northern Brazil with a couple of mycologists, and we smell the smell. You know, we smell the smell of stink horns. It's got to be here someplace. And by the time we figured it out, this thing was only about this high. And within five minutes, getting my, my camera and, and tripod and all that set up, it had grown up this high. And what is happening is this enthusiasm is exuding out from underneath the cap. In fact, even with the photograph, you can see that it's a little bit blurry because it's coming out that fast. It's really, really amazing. So this, is, this has happened within four or five minutes of discovering the mushroom that was only about this high. And then, this was another two or three minutes, and then another five minutes after that, it will be completely out. It's really amazing experience. So you don't see this that often. This is the first time I saw that actually in action. But notice, once again, the angular look of the uh, holes of the veil. Here was another stinkhorn that I saw, and I thought this might be really unusual, but my uh, favorite advisor said uh, Phallus impudicus, um, I, as I remember. And notice there's one, two, three, four, five of these here, and there are actually about two dozen around this whole area, and some of them on this stump log up, you know, four or five feet high coming out of it. And then, of course, in the heat dropping down, they come and go very, very quickly. But uh, nevertheless, very interesting. And it, apparently it was named from Africa, so it's very similar as the, as the African species, or at least morphologically. Anyway, uh, I like cordyceps as well. Cordyceps almost exclusively grow on insects, larva or truffles in the ground of some sort. And here we have an unfortunate little stink bug that, uh, that got it. I'll show you some more. This one was uh, really stumped me because uh, you start thinking of purple mushrooms, uh, Lapista, 
Lacaria, or how about Calibia iocephala, or something like that. But with the, the current gills, it kind of rules anything out. I'm not exactly sure what it is. But uh, it kind of looks like, morphologically, it looks like an armillaria to me. But uh, who knows? That's something down the road to be determined. This one was very cute. This is only about an inch across, uh, two to three centimeters. And uh, I would have been stumped on that if it weren't for the fact that a couple years ago, I saw another one in Brazil. This is um, Sarkandon bambusinus, and I had no idea Sarkandons were actually that small. Because, you know, our Sarkandons here are usually, you know, three, four, five, six inches across, very big. But um, this one taught me that no, Sarkandons can be so small, so that probably, probably was a Sarkandon. This is another thing that really stumped me and still does to this point. Um, you look at this, uh, it's got teeth, but they're all chewed up for some reason or other. And then uh, this is actually really small. It's only about a centimeter across. And here's the top. If you know Oriscalpium, the, the cone fungus, uh, it's a one species genus. There's only one species in the genus of Oriscalpium. I've seen it in different parts around the world, like um, India and Thailand. Uh, but this thing is far too light because the uh, Oriscalpium is usually much, much darker, darker brown. But it's fibrillose, it's kind of fibrous on the cap, it's laterally stiped, so it has that kind of look of an Oriscalpium. But uh, I uh, took, turned it over and it wasn't until I got back and uh, blew up this image that I realized there was somebody there checking out what I was doing, and then I saw this. And there's probably, I believe this is a little nursery for some little insects there. But nevertheless, a uh, very interesting and another yet to be named mushroom. This one has got to be some sort of cordyceps because it's got an insect, an unfortunate host on the bottom. And this one, uh, Merasmius, I don't remember the species name, but my favorite advisor gave me, uh, uh, no. That's the Melanotis. What's the, the what? Melanotis. Melanotis, okay, I knew I'd miss some of these, but you know, I can blame it on the wine downstairs, so there you go. Anyway, another great, beautiful mushroom. And this one, I, uh, I named the, uh, in, in honor of the ring-tailed lemurs, I, on, I named it the, uh, ring-tailed mushroom, but I believe this is a uh, paniolus, is that correct? Is that uh, pretty close? But very, very cute, very picturesque as well. This one, I said, oh my gosh, what is this? Is It's got a stock, it's a puffball, it's got a stock, and I'm thinking, what the heck? But I have a friend out west in the Rockies that is a puffball expert, and he says, Tulostoma tulostomo exasperatum. And normally, this would have these kind of spines all over the cap, but I caught it just kind of the end of its uh, standing light there. Nevertheless, a really, really interesting find. A little Gleophorus, uh, Hygrosibia, if you will, blue-green, very pretty. And of course, tons of little animal life. And what's really special about Madagascar is you go through the forest and there aren't any mosquitoes. And I said, well, where are the mosquitoes? And they say, well, they're all in the villages because that's where the humans are. And I'm thinking, well, why aren't they in the forest? And I'm also thinking it's probably because of all the chameleons and the, the insect predators that are in the forest. It's possible that they are the ones that are keeping the mosquitoes down. I'm not really sure. And of course there are lemurs, it's not too hard to go out and find lemurs and also, you know, get close enough to take some decent photographs. So I was fortunate to get this one. It's not that easy to get this close and get a good shot because they go really fast, they're constantly moving. And I just caught them just right at the right time. Now notice this, what this guy is doing is eating bamboo shoots and these bamboo shoots have enough arsenic to kill us, but they can eat them, and they're the only ones that can. So
So they kind of have a field day with the uh, bamboo shoots. And not only that, these lemurs, that's the greater golden lemur, these lemurs love these auricularia. And there are stories, there actually is a video of showing them finding these uh, auricularia and squabbling uh, over, you know, who gets what. But it's, it's really cute, it's a really great connection. It was actually great for me and my host, who, like I said, is a primatologist and her specialty is the lemurs, to uh, make this connection with the mushrooms because that was mine. Lots of other insects, but there's nothing there that is deadly. There are no big predators. There are no tigers or lions or anything. So you can feel very comfortable going out at night uh, as long as you don't mind a few hundred leeches on you. It's really amazing. You would walk down a trail with nothing next to you and these leeches would just appear, not big ones, they were little ones, but they would just appear like they fell out of the sky. It's pretty amazing. Um, fantastic chameleons and all kinds of other wildlife, like praying mantis and so forth. And then there was this guy. And I said, mm, so what do you do? You poke it, right? See if it moves or it, it squeals or something like that. Well, I found a few of these other things. Now, imagine here what I did is I picked this one on the right, and this is what was left. And it reminded me of Lactarius. Lactarius, which is normally orange, but you know, when it stains or gets old, turns green. And it's possible there is a chemical, chemical connection. I'm not really sure, but of course what I did before um, I got too far is slice the thing open now, it might look like this is hollow, but it isn't. It's actually completely uh, uh, semi, uh, how do you say, uh, uh, sem uh, hemispherical, and, uh, but just very clear. And I think in time that would turn greenish as well. But really, really uh, an oddball. And I always love it when my advisors or experts say, not a clue. I have no idea because uh, I don't have a clue. And this is this is part of my love of doing this is finding these things that are just completely out there. Maybe people know what they are. Maybe they don't. We'll we'll hear more about that in just a bit. Anyway, here's another cordyceps. Um, I've seen something like this in Southeast Asia. Cordyceps newtons. Maybe that's what it was. Of course, another unfortunate host. This uh, I would recognize as a Campanella. To me, the closest what I've seen that has a name is Campanella tristis. And then these things, and I'm thinking, wow, this looks like Phyllobelitis manipularis, or Poromycena, as they call it. There's a bunch of different names. It's a Phyllobelitis mushroom in Southeast Asia. But those are white. This has got a kind of greenish look to it. Really beautiful mushroom, but I'm looking at the cap and I'm saying, hmm, there is something going on under there. So as soon as I took these photos, and I mean took the upright photos, I tipped it over and took a look. Now this is a perfect example of a mushroom that is either going from gills to pores or pores to gills. And who knows which direction or if it is settled happily right where it is and stayed that way for millions and millions of years. But uh, nevertheless, it's really a good example of uh, halfway here and halfway there. Here is another classic look of a Merasmus. Uh, I, uh, they generally have very few gills, at least relative to a lot of other mushrooms, but I counted this as one, two, three, four and a half. Four and a half gills on this Merasmus. A new stinkhorn to me, I mentioned that I love stinkhorns. This is a very different one. This is um, Bluminavia uh, angolensis. Uh, this is, a, like I said, new to me. And also, notice the, all the insects. And as we look at the stinkhorns, always uh, check out the insects that are around them. Uh, beautiful Merasmus. This is a classic Merasmus. We might call this Hematocephalus but uh, 
My point is that this made it into the calendar this year. So if you like this one, you can have it for uh, at least a full month and uh, longer if you want to keep it. Anyway, so I didn't find any bioluminescent mushrooms the first couple of weeks. So we decided that the best thing to do was to go out into the deep forest, the old growth forest. And that was so four or five uh, hours into the forest. And unfortunately, a lot more leeches out there. But that's all right. I wanted to at least have a good shot at find some, finding some bioluminescent mushrooms. And remember, the ones that I showed you before were from up north. I hadn't seen any down in Ronomapana. And I'd gone out two or three times at night and not seen anything at all. So they, Patricia suggested that I go to the old growth forest. So uh, me and my guide went out and he took my, my tent and all that and set the whole thing up. Well, when we got there, it had been raining like crazy. This is good for me, bad for them. This is uh, Rachel and her whole crew that were out in the rain looking for lemurs, of course. I was looking for mushrooms, so as far as I'm concerned, the rain was just fine. So while it was still light, and normally what I would do is go out and case out the trail, because it makes it so much easier to find your way around if you know where you're going. So um, when it did get light, what I would do is go out, and I got my uh, my guide and uh, we would out go out together and and uh, this is what it looks like through my camcorder which does ultraviolet, uh, ultraviolet light but actually I'm looking at the darkness <laughs> with my flashlight I on once in a while and I try and keep it on as little as possible so when I do see something uh, I mean, so I'm able to see it if there's something out there, and there was. Unfortunately, it was about to rain, but I did get some really, really good shots. I got a couple of really good shots of whatever this is. I still don't know what this is, but I love these. I just love the look of the cap, and of course, it's the uh, glowing green. That's always spiritual for me, as I've told you. I'm a lunatic, and that's what happens. But I told my guy, as it started to rain, I said, look, just pick all we can, and I'll take them into my tent. So here I am in my tent with all these sticks and my boots and my camera and all my gear. Fortunately, we were under an overhang, so it was completely dry. You zip up the zipper and make sure all the leeches are out and they won't get in. So I had the whole night uh, to take pictures of these bioluminescent mushrooms. Um, you know, to uh, as long as long as I could, and what a wonderful feeling! It's a very special, once again, a spiritual feeling to go to sleep next to 20 or 30 little glowing green <laughs> mushrooms. Really superb. Here's one of the ones that I found, and of course, lots more. But like I say, this shape was very new to me. Something I hadn't seen in bioluminescent mushrooms, but very special. And hopefully, in the future, we'll get a name for these. Anyway, on my way out, word had gotten out that I was there and I was doing pictures and so forth. So I went to the university in Tana, as they say. And uh, this uh, young man right here is a biologist, botanist. And uh, he set up this whole show for the faculty. There was about half a dozen faculty and a bunch of students. And they were just enthralled with the fact, uh, what I did is I did only Madagascar mushrooms. I only did what I had photographed there the past month. And so they were so enthralled with what is happening in their country and the fact that it was just, it's a frontier, it's beautiful and so forth. It, we might get two or three or four mycologists out of this group right here. Really, that was one of the best things that I did is put on a show for them. Anyway, right after that, <clears throat> I went to Brazil. I've been there before, had a great time. I've made connections. I know where I want to go, and I know what I want to find. We'll see that. Anyway, we are down in Paraná, which is one of the southern states, and near the ocean on the, uh, the Atlantic rainforest plain there. So I'm hunting around these areas. There is a road through there someplace. 
One of the things by day I found was a little Mycena, beautiful little thing. These are really, really small. So if it's not very clear, it's just because I've blown this up as big as I possibly can. This is a, a little mushroom, uh, with, which is really interesting because you might think a lot of these little white things would have white spores, but it doesn't. You can see some of the spores starting to form like that. So, oops, let's go back here and uh, either a gray or a gray-black, black spores. And they're growing on these, just a, a flower, one of the uh, plants along the, the trail. A few years ago, I found this very bright, big, bright Mycena Dusta. It was the only one of its kind that I saw. So it's, it's one of the reasons I want to come back. I did that same trail again, but I didn't find anything that was kind of on a higher altitude. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But on one of the lower ones, what I noticed is that what I had done is I had gone down the trail looking for bioluminescent mushrooms, and I found this one. This is Geronema virulucens, and uh, I had picked it because it was glowing, and I put a leaf down next to the trail so when I came back, I could find it. And when I came back, there was this insect. It looks like a cricket or something like that, but there is definitely a major connection. We'll see more of this in, in, in the, the rest of the show as well, of these insects and the bioluminescence. I, uh, I think there, this is very important connection. Anyway, uh, this year, this last year, um, Mycena asterina, is that right? Very, very small, but very, very bright. Uh, they're only about two or three millimeters across, but you can see them 20 feet away because they are so bright, they're like little stars. They're very, very bright, very beautiful little mushroom. And notice the stem doesn't glow at all. And as you watch these, notice that some, the stem only glows, some, both of them, and some just the cap. This is a photo of it. Uh, like I say, a really largely uh, expanded, blown up, but very fragile little mushroom. Anyway, I saw these, kind of a classic, beautiful Merasmus, and uh, I said, gosh, you know, uh, you've heard of the kitty cam, and the snake cam, and the surfboard cam, and the weather cam, and this cam and that cam. Has anybody in this room who didn't go to the show up in Soma, has anybody heard of the cam cam? Well, I put my video camcorder on my camera, and this is what happened. I'm going to turn up the volume here because I think I've got some. I put this together last week. of, and uh, another stinkhorn, this is, uh, I believe, Mutinus uh, argentinensis, um, at least that's uh, what I've been told, and notice uh, that, yes, is a real finger, that is an earth star. Um, I don't know if we have these little tiny earth stars in America, I haven't seen them, but other places, <coughs> certainly, little tiny, uh, beautiful, beautiful little earth stars. And some more unnamed um, purple mushrooms, and of course, some more friends now traveling through uh, Brazil in the rainforest at night is a little more dangerous than Madagascar. But uh, if you just keep your distance, always remember these snakes, they really don't want to hurt you. They just want to protect themselves. And if you just you know, use any common sense, uh, you won't have any problem. Lots and lots of beautiful, beautiful butterflies down there. We're, you know, still around Brazil. And these things, if you don't know this and you travel in these areas, stay away from these fuzzy, beautiful-looking little caterpillars because I believe 
most of them, if not all of them, are poisonous. And I've never, I mean, I feel like I want to put my finger up next to this, but I, I've heard better and know better, so I don't. Okay, what we have here, this is Nasenche Pio Iguazu. And what that means is the birthplace of the Iguazu River. And um, I said, well, okay, someone wanted to take me up there. This is one of the most beautiful little forest tropical scenes I've ever been to. And of course, it didn't hurt to have this fog there, but it was really, really gorgeous. And guess what? There it is. There's the beginning of the river. And you might think, well, who cares? The reason is on the other end of this river is one of the greatest falls on the planet, Foz de Iguazu. It's 275 separate falls that go on for about two and a half kilometers. It's really, really incredible. So guys, if you want a hot date, you can use it. If you want to take her on a hot date, that's the place to go to. And if she likes mushrooms, all you have to do is turn around. This is just right facing that falls. And to this day, no one has been able to identify it. There are lots of things. And the beauty of it is, is that with all this, the uh, water vapor and mist coming off the falls, it, it probably has a continual flora of mushrooms around there. I didn't spend enough time. Uh, I had a week. They gave me a week in the park for free, which was very nice, just to take mushrooms for uh, the Brazilian Park Service. But um, it's just a wonderful chance to, to find mushrooms when it might be really dry everywhere else, like here. But anyway, on we go. I found this next to there, and so I'm sure that's the same thing, just an expanded version, so when this kind of fruits out, it becomes kind of a, a very pithy, but gilled structure of some sort. Don't know exactly what that is. This one I did. Uh, this I've seen in Puerto Rico and other places, Philip C. Domingensis, a beautiful little ask of my seat. Now I'm back down in the Atlantic Rainforest, and I'm looking up at uh, Mount Marumbi, and there is a train that goes from the flatlands up along the side of the mountain and heads off towards Curitiba, which is over there someplace, you know, about 75 kilometers away. And so I wanted to go hunt for bioluminescent mushrooms <coughs> up there. So I didn't really tell anybody what I was doing. Of course, I usually don't. But I took the last train up the mountain, got off on Marumbi Station, which is a hiking, up hiking down. They wouldn't let me hike up, but they would let me hike down. So I got off about 6.30, and then I waited and waited and waited for it to get dark. And I was very confident, I thought I knew how to get all the way back down there. It took about three hours to get to the next park station, which I found, it was all really good but um, and then took a taxi back uh, to Mojets where uh, I was staying. But I found mushrooms. Oh, this is the train up the hill, and that's, of course, the mountain, and that's, of course, my self-portrait self of me in my boots. And before I get to the bioluminescent ones, this actually is a lot darker than it looks. Fortunately, with the new uh, cameras, it, it, they take much, much better photos in the dark. In fact, I bought a bigger, better, faster camera today for the next set of bioluminescent mushrooms that I'm going to collect and bring to you. But uh, anyway, I took this picture, and I love these because they're blue. And uh, this is Clotosabula azurescens, and if you buy a calendar, you will get this for August. Just keep that in mind. Three for twenty dollars. Anyway, I love this. Uh, I love this. I love blue mushrooms. So here's what I found on the trail as I was kind of sneaking my way down through the park and uh, and out of there. Anyway, at some point it was uh, time to come back. <coughs> oh gosh. Oh oh my 
gosh. Um, you know, I did plug this in, but um, I think I yanked it out at some point. Hang on, hang on. You know how technology is. Hey, <laughs> don't you like it when things work? No, we got it, we got it, we got it. It's pretty amazing. I remember that I tripped on it and must have pulled out the plug. Anyway, back home to Florida. This is one of my favorite palm trees. I love palm trees. This is Phoenix canariensis, and I think you might have the same species here because I see something very similar, but really, really beautiful palm tree. Anyway, another friend up in Virginia. This is a, a timber rattler, but uh, so you have to be a little more careful, actually, in the United States. It's a lot, to, it's not quite as, dangerous in some of these exotic places. This is Microstoma flocosum. This is another all new stuff coming up here. Um, and I'm uh, particularly showing you things you wouldn't necessarily see around here, but just to you know, let you know what's available when you do go east. Uh, Cantorellus lateridius, smooth, smooth uh, chanterelle. And remember that Cyptotroma aspirata that I was talking about. That photo I took was about as big as that and spiny. And normally those spines would continue on the top. This is a little bit different, but they call this the same thing, Cyptochroma esprata. This is from West Virginia. And uh, another one from up there someplace, Mycena leana. And what you need to see here are the marginate gills. It's really, really beautiful Mycena. I love those. And this one is a big mushroom that can be, you know, two, three, four feet across, Bondergeria berkeleyi, and for scale, there's my knife right there. But normally not as, you know, symmetrical and kind of beautifully shaped. I've seen several of these, and this is definitely the, the prettiest of the bunch. Hypocreopsis, something, you know, I just took because it, it looked interesting to me. But it turns out this has not been found that, that frequently, kind of a rare one. And uh, Hematrichia serpula, I've seen this yellow, but I've never seen this kind of an orange red. So, but really gorgeous. And of course, uh, Chloris aborea, or Splenium, whatever you want to call it. And they have hygrosides, hygrospe cuspidata. Um, the US, I mean, the, the West Coast certainly has. Um, you know, I think, you know, the, the, some of the most beautiful hygrosities when it rains, of course, but uh, it, will, it, it will do that again. But on the East Coast, they have lots and lots of reticulate bolides, and very, sometimes very reticulate bolides like this. This is Retabolitis or Nautapase, and Trichlomopsis rutilans, but I must say, the most beautiful one I've ever photographed was up in Humboldt. This was just uh, last year, Tri Trichlomopsis rutilans. Here's another one from the east. This is a Hohenbuchelia, Hohenbuchelia mastrucata, and a shot from below. And uh, this is my favorite uh, Valentine Mushroom so far, Calistoma. Kiss me, I'm a Calistoma. Calistoma in sickness. And then again, here we go. These are great, big, beautiful jack o' lantern mushrooms, Omphalotus illudens. And these actually glow in the dark. However, I have, up until recently, I tried many times to get a shot of these. And what I realize now. It isn't necessarily the photographer or the camera or whatever. Sometimes they glow and sometimes they don't. That's all there's to it. And if you get them when they do glow a lot, uh, you just consider yourself lucky. So at one point, uh, just a few months ago, I saw a collection, the biggest group of these I've ever seen, probably 200 in about two dozen different clumps. So I got one of those clumps and I got the photo that made me happy for the species Omphalotus illudens. <coughs> Another one that I hadn't, uh, I'd seen, but I hadn't seen, hadn't photographed bioluminescent was uh, Pinellus stypticus, and this is a gilled mushroom, 
got some good photos of that. And uh, back in Florida, a couple of years ago, I found this. And I thought first it was a chanterelle because on the ground, I didn't expect to see any jack-o'-lanterns around Florida, but it turns out this is Ompelotus sub -eludens. So the Ompelotus eludens, I, they call the jack-o'-lantern, I call this the jill-o'-lantern. And uh, in James Kimbrough's book on common Florida mushrooms, he says this is not known to be bioluminescent. But two years ago, I got what might be the first ever uh, photo of the bioluminescence of this mushroom. However, this year, I was looking for it, and I was ready, because I realized I needed to have a bigger, better, faster, expensive camera that did this very well. So when I found them a couple of months ago, I got the shot. Mm -hmm. So this is Ompelotus subeludens. And uh, also, this one, I saw this from the top, I said, oh, it's Pinellus stepticus, until I turned it over and realized this is not gill, this is pored. And then looked it up, this is uh, Pinellus pusillus, or probably Pinellus pusillus. And I you know, took it home and turned off the lights and waited you know, 10 minutes and couldn't see any glow at all until I, it was at the same time I was doing the Ompelota subaludens. And somehow in the corner of my eye, there was a little piece like this or something, I don't remember exactly what it was, but it was bright green, and I said, oh my gosh, I wonder if these are bioluminescent. So I set this up in front of another bigger, better, faster camera that I had rented, and I took a picture, not even being able to see any glow at all, but the camera caught it. So at least the, the first record I've taken of these in Florida. Not a great shot, but nevertheless, it did the job. So I got an invitation right after that to go to China, and my job was to, uh, it was a bunch of students from all over the world, China, US, and many other places, and my job was to do a little video, some shots, uh, go out in the forest with them, you know, do their work in the forest, their field work, and so forth. So it was about 10% of my time was occupied with that, and the rest of it was just totally up to me to do whatever I wanted. Fortunately, this is a place that I've been to before, Zhishuan Banan Tropical Botanical Garden, which is right at the bottom of Yunnan province in western China. So it's very tropical, it's right next to Laos and Thailand, and has, I think, 20,000 plus species of plants. And it's just beautiful, safe, relatively flat, so they gave you a bike, and off I went uh, hunting mushrooms. So my job, like I said, was to do the professors, and the uh, leader of it all, Chuck Cannon, and uh, of course, go to the parties. Had a lot of fun at the parties. They worked hard, and they played hard. Of course, they were all young, having a great time, and so forth. But when I went to these, I was thinking, it's getting dark out there. And all of a sudden, I'm thinking, well, I think I'm going to go home a little bit early. And it was really good that I did, because I was not expecting anything. But I went through one of the bamboo forests, and this is what I saw. And I said, oh my gosh. Of course, I had been drinking a lot, so I wasn't exactly sure. But uh, sure enough, I got closer and closer. And it was bioluminescent mushrooms. Now, the odd thing about these is that this was a species that I had photographed before, um, um, a Favalacia. But the odd thing is that when they're fresh, they don't glow at all. So they have to senesce. They have this in process of dying that they start glowing. So I did a bunch of these over the past, over, over, uh, couple of weeks of time. So I got a lot of photographs of these in that process. And apparently, apparently, um, although the mushrooms had been known to science, the bioluminescence had not. I don't know. But uh, it was definitely a wonderful surprise for me. So 
Very beautiful. Now, uh, what you notice about these things is that there's all kinds of insects and animal slugs and so forth. There, there's, like I said, there is something going on there, probably with the bioluminescence to attract them or whatever. There's a mysterious connection which the, the, uh, the academics, the scientists are figuring out as we speak. Anyway, I wanted to show you what these things look like when they're fresh. These won't glow as they are because they're brand new and fresh, but really, really beautiful mushroom. And of course, this uh, bubble nature just reflects with the, the pores underneath, big pores. So you're just, it's very translucent. You're looking right at the top of the pores. And another stinkhorn, possibly a Jansia, something I hadn't seen before. That was good. And this one, I thought, Oh, this is Lysurus cruciatus, and so I photographed that, and you know, this and that, and over a couple, three weeks, I saw four different ones like that, and uh, in my first mailer after I got back, I was talking about the bioluminescent mushrooms, and I put a little picture of one of these at the bottom of the mailer, and a mycologist from the Bay Area wrote to me with no less than a dozen exclamation points saying, Taylor, this is the real Lysurus gardneri. And so I had to look it all up because I had no idea what he was talking about. But apparently, the name Lysurus gardneri was named uh, 1847 from Ceylon. There's a couple of black and white photographs and it's been used on many, many different mushrooms around the world, but apparently all in error. And because the real Lysurus gardneri has a section of sterile tissue like this, where all the rest of them, the gleba, the spore mass, goes down all this way, but this distinguishes a Lysurus gardneri. It's possibly it isn't that, maybe something new, who knows. But great find nevertheless. And of course, oh my gosh, one more uh, netted stinkhorn or holy veil, as I like to say. But what I loved about these is the fact that more, lots of insects and lots of butterflies on these things as well. Look at all the insects on this thing. Anyway, I'm going to end this with a series. We're going to go back to Brazil. And I want to, I want to say this for the end, because what I call the Fazenda series a week stretch was one of the most incredible things that happened in my mushroom photography <coughs> career. Okay, I have a friend. I've made friends with a businessman who had 6,000 acres through uh, the thoughtfulness of his father who gave it to his three sons. He was one of the, the three. And he said, Taylor, because he knew what I did, he liked what I did, he was a businessman, but he was also a nature lover, photographer, so forth. And he said, Taylor, take the house, stay as long as you want, just do whatever you want to do. And guess what? Here's Atlantic rainforest right out the back, 50 feet away. I said, oh my God, this is dreamy. There's no internet, there's no telephones. This is fantastic. I can stay up as long as I want, which I did. And if you want food, you've got to walk seven kilometers to the store or wait for the, the bus that comes up a couple times a week and, you know, try and figure out how to get back. But uh, by the time you get to the town, it may be blazing hot. It could be raining when you start, blazing hot when you get there, and raining when you get back. But nevertheless, they had beer and coffee and food and, and the telephone in case you wanted to call. If you want to do email, I mean, that's another 30 miles away, but you know, at least you can use the telephone. This is the land of big grass. This is elephant grass and for scale, this is, this is how big this actually is. So I did some hunting there and some of the rainforest. Now they had 2,000, about a third of the property was recovering rainforest, some old growth, but some recovering. So this is what they were trying to do, is help uh, the rainforest kind of recover to uh, the way it used to be. Because a lot of this used to be old buffalo farms, water buffalo farms, and uh, sugar cane. So by day, I would go out, like I mentioned before in Madagascar, by day, 
I would go out and case out all the trails and kind of get to know the forest so I can get home because I'm doing this all myself. And uh, I don't have a guide here at all, but um, I would case it out, kind of learn the trail, and I never, ever would go out with a comp without a compass because the sky would almost always be covered over with clouds, sometimes raining off and on, and you have to be able to get back. So this is why I would do that. It, as it turns out, I hit it right on time. This is really perfect timing. And one of the reasons you see me sloshing around is because a lot of the mushrooms that I saw were half in water and half out. They apparently just really like, like it when it's really, really wet, at least the ones that I found. Here's another one. I'm looking straight up at a stick, so all these are coming straight out of a stick. But one of the greatest things that happened to me was finding a log that had between two and three hundred glowing mushrooms. And this one I knew. This is my Sinalucentipes. And this, this, the fact that only the stipe glowed led to what you're going to see. What you're seeing here is only half the stick. Here's the other half. It was absolutely incredible. And of course, in the forest, it's raining every five minutes, so I really couldn't do anything serious in the forest as far as photography, so I took it home. And I set it up. And that night, started taking pictures. And you can imagine, with, with all these mushrooms, there are lots and lots of different scenes. So I took some, and uh, I was taking some photographs. And I was thinking, gosh, you know, uh, it'd be great if, well, I tried my LED light on it. And uh, here I'll show you, try my LED light. And for ID purposes, this is great, and I'm thinking, well, you know, it's been done before, but why don't I mix them? Like, take a, a three-minute shot for the bioluminescence and then shine my LED light for a few seconds to see what happens. Right off the bat, they turned out incredibly. This is the first one I did. And I said, wow, that's really great. So I spent all evening long until it got light, you know, until the sun came up, because you, you, know, you have to have the dark, doing the same thing doing kind of mixes of these things, like this, with some just wonderful, wonderful effect. And the next night, the clouds parted, and I realized it was a full moon. And I said, oh my god, I've got to do this. So I took the stick outside, and I started taking pictures of bioluminescent mushrooms and moonlight. That's all you're seeing here. No artificial light. What you're seeing in the background, who's that? Who's making noise? It's the rain. It's the rain, yeah. Well, as long as the, you can hear my voice, it's OK. I'm still alive. Anyway, so I did this. I said, this is really incredible. So I started taking pictures with first the bioluminescence and then with the moonlight. And for something like this, what I would do is cover the mushrooms. So the, for the, the first one, I would cover with a, a coat or, or an umbrella so the moonlight wouldn't hit it and then take a picture with the moonlight. So it's about a minute of moonlight and three or four minutes for the, the picture itself. Anyway, what happened was probably one of the best photos I've ever taken, I think, of mushrooms. Uh, only because of the uniqueness and so forth, and also, fortunately, this got picked up in a very famous location. I have been told that this photo will appear in May in the front section, Visions of Earth, two-page spread, this May in National Geographic magazine.
So I have only one thing more to show you. I did a little video a couple months ago called Spirits of the Forest. It's the music of mine, and it's all bioluminescent mushrooms. I will uh, try the amp here. Thank you all very much. Okay, we are going for it. So while he's going for the lights, any questions? So some of the mushrooms that you're taking, the bioluminescent mushrooms that were, you couldn't see them yourself, but you could with the camera. No, I can. No, you can. They're, they're a little, they're, often very dim, but you've got to get, you, what you do is you walk down the forest with as little flashlight as possible. So I walk about three quarters of the time in the dark, and then you flash the, uh, you flash the light when you think you need to before you trip on something. And so you're just constantly looking around, and you will see them. Um, sometimes they're bright, a lot of times they're not. And then you work on getting a photo. Yes. So do, you, do you have like a time lapse uh, technique that you use to, to get a, to absorb all the Well, it's just a, I have a, a, a switch. You just it's a, you put it on bulb, which basically means the switch just opens the camera and it doesn't close until you flick the switch again. So three, four, five minutes sometimes. So yes. I have one of those. I haven't found mushrooms that, that glow, but I hear there there are, and I know I'm going to find some. Yeah, but they don't, but the ones that do glow, they don't, they don't, you know, you can't force them to glow. Huh. Yes, yes. You're talking about two different processes. Yeah. You're talking about fluorescence. Fluorescence. They don't versus fluorescence. luminescence. Yeah. yeah. And fluorescence is when you shine a light at one wavelength on an organism. Yeah. These produce their own light, completely produce their own light, which is what I, I love about them. Yes? Digital, yeah. Oh, yes, absolutely. And one of the things is that in, in three or four or five minutes, I mean, a lot of times these, these mushrooms move. You know, either they're growing or dying or something happens, and so you've got to check them. And a lot of times, you know, that's a, that turnaround, and it just takes a lot of time for each photo. Well, as of today, <laughs> as of today, it's a Canon 6D. 
but uh, I was using a 60D, which is okay if they're bright. It's not known 